Hey everyone, this is part two of our discussion with Ron Nincy. It picks up right where we left off in part one. Welcome back. So we kind of we go beyond just looking at sort of trends in um, economic success and trends in poverty in this report to investigate what are the what are the factors that are associated with, with greater success for Black men mm -hmm. um, in America. And one of the things that we um, kind of investigate is sort of how you know conventional factors um, in much of the research today things like um, education, work, mm -hmm. contact with the criminal justice system are linked to black men's success. What is the story that we that we find in the report on those on those factors? Well, you know, I think that we find that the um, the 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 critical factors that are involved in building and displaying human capital are very important for entering the middle and upper class. So uh, the role of higher education is is critical. The work uh, the work experience is critical, um, uh, and particularly. You know, we've had a long discussion over the past two, de two decades about um, the separation of the earnings distribution between people who have higher education and people who don't. Right. And, and, uh, and so uh, military service is also a critical factor, particularly for this particular cohort of African-American men, because when they were entering adulthood, uh, the proportion of African-American men who were going to college was, was very small. And so military service pr provided sort of an alternative route to entering the middle class for many. And so I think those three factors associated work, education, and military service associated with gaining human capital and, and getting sort of a, um, an advanced position in their subsequent attempts for employment, right. um, those are critical factors for African-American men. And I think uh, they, they tell us some things about uh, how we w ought to be paying more attention to make sure that young African-American to men today are not only getting into college, but completing college. And so uh, that encourages and directs some of the work that, that, is un that we are trying to undertake even now. So I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about the report is the way in which we find that you know, military service in particular is linked to better outcomes for black men um, you know, in midlife. Um, and the way in which in particular both marriage and work mediate that relationship. So we find, you know, obviously that the black men who served in the military married at higher rates, mm -hmm. um, you know, later on in life, and, and they worked at higher rates later on in life, um, you know, beyond their their military service. What do you think it, is it about the U.S. military that seems to um, foster perhaps a stronger work orientation and also a, a stronger orientation towards marriage. In fact, one study suggests that the U.S. military is the one institution in, in America mm -hmm. where there is no racial divide in marriage rates. Just striking. What, what do you think is going on with the military there? Well, I know for, for one thing, um, military service will introduce lots of African-American men into an entirely different culture uh, that you know, differs from their own background in lots of ways. Uh, I remember when my own older brother served um, in the military during the Vietnam era. And um, many things about that experience, I recall him coming home on his first leave and all the things I learned about that were completely new to me as a consequence of his exposure to lots of whites uh, in the military where they were in some ways shoulder to shoulder and they had to deal with you know lots of discrimination and the like but uh, he rubbed shoulders with, with, with young white men at the time and the things that they were doing became normalized for, for his experience and I think uh, the role of marriage, the way in which the military supports marriage and has to understand the importance of strong marriages in order to enable soldiers to survive and function. I think that that, that culture in the military is something that, that uh, men generally and African American in particular men uh, begin to embrace and repeat and I think it's a good thing for them. Uh, so I think that's part of what, what goes on. Um, in addition, I think the military is also a place in which um, African-American men acquire uh, access to training and skills that they could barely get uh, anywhere else and where they will leave with not only skills, uh, spe specialized skills in certain areas, but employer preferences that are a consequence of their military service. So in, and so in a lot of ways, uh, and that, uh, that um, facilitates 
marriage on the one hand and the stability of marriage after the fact. Sure. And so, uh, so there's a kind of signaling device it, going it, on. It, yeah, it, is, it is, is operating you know, before, during, and after right. uh, in terms of sustaining uh, marriages, which are obviously a critical key to entering the middle class, if for no other reason that you have two incomes. Right. So I, I think um, this, this is an important, has been an important tool in the experience of African Americans making the transition from, from poverty to the middle class. And I think we have to figure out uh, what are some alternative ways in which we can sort of uh, uh, acquire those same experiences and, and, uh, and reinforce the things that, uh, that facilitate economic success for black men. You know, one of the things that comes out in the report is just the fact that for black men, being married is strongly associated with higher family income, you know, in one's 50s. Um, and um, I think what people don't always realize there, too, is that black wives are much more likely to be employed than other wives are in America. So when black men are, are getting married, when they're staying married, um, it has a big impact on their family income because the women in their lives are much more likely to be in the labor force. Yeah. What's, what's the story there, do you think? Well, you know, I think particularly for, for this cohort, I mean, uh, for this cohort, it was much more true that earlier in their dual careers, African-American women are as likely to be in the labor force as their husbands. And in many cases, I recall writing a paper uh, a uh, couple of decades ago, the earnings of African American women wives eclipse those of many of their husbands. So, so, so when you pair two incomes and those incomes, it's much like uh, what's happening in the general population when uh, uh, you know college, the association between college and marital status has increased in the United States. Right. And so, and it is also true that. Uh, people uh, with higher educational attainment are more likely to marry. And so in the same way that that's contributing to inequality uh, generally in the population, it is af absolutely in the cohort that we focused on contributing to higher economic status among African-American men who married. They had, two, they had two incomes into their households and their wives were not only more likely to work, but to work at higher wages than other women. And so it was a, it's a ticket into the middle class and one that I think is important. The final thing that we, that we find in terms of kind of a factor that's linked at least to greater success for black men is a sense of personal agency. Mm -hmm. So black men who, who sort of thought of themselves as kind of captains of their own lives, um, who, who didn't sort of think that they were kind of just subject to fate or to their environment, were more likely to be flourishing. And what's striking to me in looking at the models is sort of how this, this uh, variable uh, was what we call kind of robust, even after controlling for things like their education, their military service, their religiosity, their marital statuses. So mm -hmm. above and beyond those other factors, having a strong sense of being you know, in control of your own life mm -hmm. as a young man mm -hmm. was linked to them being more successful in their 50s. Yeah. So this is a pretty interesting association across the years. What do you think is going on there? And then what lessons sh should we draw from that for kind of engaging young black men today? Well, um, so uh, in some, some ways, my thinking around this, uh, and I don't, I don't know why, is more influenced by the idea that when you have a strong sense of personal agency, you can recover from failure. Uh, you, um, you are likely to conclude as a consequence of some unsuccessful experience that um, I can learn from this, I can regroup, and I can learn how to do better uh, the next time. Right. Uh, and so, you know, one of the, uh, some of the most successful in, um, entrepreneurs are people who failed in business many times because they had a sense that they could learn from their past and regroup and, and, and correct in the future. Um, the thing I worry about this finding is sort of what does it really mean? Because I, I know that these non-cognitive skills right. are, um, they're, it, it, it's, it's not clear what their origin is. Sure. Um, it's not clear that they are, for example, highly associated with, with family background because you can have two siblings within the same family right. Right. who have different, who score differently on, right. on these measures. Sure. And so uh, I think it's an important question, but how to produce it is, is, is right. unclear. Yeah. Uh, but I certainly think it, um, efforts to engage young 
African American men in ex in experiences where they try things, they fail, they learn to regroup and move on is an important part of sort of the youth development that has to occur. And it sort of reminds me, in some ways, of this book that I wrote uh, in the 1990s about nurturing young black males and what what youth serving organizations can do to foster positive youth development. And it's it's just. Uh, I'm sort of in some ways coming full circle as a right. result of this report, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, so just two more questions here. Sure. One is, um, what are some of the policy takeaways, do you think, um, coming from this report? Uh, what, uh, what can we do to increase, in a sense, the number of black men who are on these avenues towards the middle and upper class? You know, um, what, yeah, what, what, are, what are some things that policymakers can do? Well, um, so one thing we haven't talked about, which I found striking, and I'm still noodling on it, is while uh, coming from an advantage background was a strong predictor of entering the middle class or higher, coming from a disadvantaged background was not a significant predictor of being poor as a man. And, and I think this is very, very important because among the, 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 the phrases in the negative narrative is the intergenerational uh, transition of poverty. That Black people in general and young black men in particular who are born into poor families are doomed to enter poverty themselves. And our results just do not support that. And so then the question is, what are the variety of things that policy can do to, to, to help insulate the children and boys in particular who are born into poor families to, to ensure that they escape that fate themselves. And I think among those things uh, have to do with early childhood education and the things that, you know, I am, I'm an economist by training, but I'm increasing, uh, but I work in the school of social work. And so I'm sort of drawn near like a, like a moth to the flame right. uh, to these discussions about uh, uh, the traumatic experiences that children in poverty experience when they're young and the consequences they have for children as they mature. So I want to think of something very simple and straightforward. So when you transition from uh, elementary school to junior high school, you have to learn that you're not only taking your classes and your homework assignments in the same room from the same teacher, but you go to junior high school and you have to go to different classes and uh, get, get accustomed to instructions of different kinds of teachers. Well, um, that takes a certain amount of executive functioning, which is compromised by the trauma that one might experience in a household in which there is poverty, there's lack of food, there may be lots of domestic violence. You're born into a single parent household, which is the case for most African American children. And so uh, dealing with these, these factors that cause trauma and stress among mothers and trauma and stress among young children, uh, we can do more in terms of public policy to ensure that just the very brain architecture of children is uh, to protect that so that they have the capacity to educate themselves well and then enter college. Uh, and so then we have more work to do because we have uh, closed much of the gap between um, uh, high school graduation among African-American boys and girls and among blacks, between blacks and whites. But while we're admitting more black uh, and uh, boys of color to college, they're not graduating. And so I think we can do more. This is one of the things, for example, right. that the Executive Alliance is working on. We can do more to try to figure out uh, what is holding African-American uh, and uh, other boys of color from graduating and what specialized interventions do they need in order to help them succeed in, in that area. So, and then I think the other big one that comes out of our study is on the downside, that um, uh, having um, any kind of contact with the criminal justice system is a, uh, prevents you from entering the middle class and uh, virtually assures that you'll enter poverty. And therefore, this whole discussion of mass incarceration, the, uh, the inequity in the, in the uh, administration of criminal justice is definitely something that uh, is part of the negative narrative and we need to stay on that and, and repair it so that more uh, African American men can, fo can you know, follow the, the route of success that, uh, that is documented in our report. And then finally, what, you know, if you're kind of sort of thinking about the, the cultural takeaways for, you know, for teachers mm -hmm. um, in high schools, for parents in communities, for, you know, for the black church, um, and, and for the media as well, what sort of, what are the, what are the takeaways at sort of the more cultural level from our report? Well, I think for the sake of time, it seems to me that the most important one is the message to the church. Um, you know, government cannot do everything, and uh, churches uh, are 
places where our reports suggest that uh, boys who attended, African American boys who had regular church or religious attendance were more likely to enter the middle or upper classes when they became adults. And so I, I, my hope is that our re report will encourage and embolden the things that are already occurring in African American churches to train up a child in the way he we, in which he should go. I also think that we had, a, we had an interesting trick question or question at us uh, yesterday, and it yeah. was about, uh, I'm trying to uh, paraphrase the question, what do you think uh, is, is behind the association between um, uh, church attendance as a youth and, and, and their performance in the middle class? And, and our answer is, did the, did, the, did the standard socially acceptable thing about uh, uh, church attendance sort of reinforces uh, cultural norms, uh, that are associated with moving into the middle class and so forth. Um, but I also think, no, that African-American boys and girls who go to church also hear the word of God. And they hear it in ways that promote exactly the kinds of behaviors that are moving them into the middle class. For example, um, you know, they hear things and they are taught in Sunday school, um, children obey your parents as in the Lord, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, which, uh, so that it will be well with you and you will live long on the earth. Um, one of the things that is saying is pay attention to the guidance of your parents throughout your life course because they will help direct you in ways that protect you and keep you out of things uh, that will uh, that will, for example, expose you to the criminal justice system. They hear things like, um, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Bad company corrupts good, good morals. Um, one of the most important challenges that African-American parents have to deliver for your kids is be careful who your friends are. All right, because you may not be into a lot of things, but your friends may be. And if you travel around with them, if you're caught in the car with someone who is drinking or whatever it is, you expose yourself to this kind of risk. And so these kinds of messages, which are, let's face it, unpopular in our society, um, are the things that go on in the church. And therefore, uh, my hope is, I know I um, uh, called a... Uh, 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 a young man uh, who was a former student of mine in the School of Social Work who is now a pastor of the church, and I sent him the report and said, listen, go forth and do good things in the ministry that you have to men and boys. Make sure to emphasize these things because they're going to, uh, they're, they're going to be critical in the lives of the young people that you're working with. So uh, my hope is that, uh, that they will be emboldened, and other institutions as well will not be afraid. And there, there is also, what is it? Um, you know, the, the message, an excellent wife Right, you know, Proverbs 23. These young men hear these things in church, and as they go older, they begin to screen the young women that they're that they're in relationship with, uh, and and I think that's that's important. Um, uh, as young people begin to choose partners and begin to think about the kinds of women that they will marry as opposed to date, these are very important messages that that stick with them, and those are messages that are learned in the church. And I also hope that it will encourage uh, many. African American parents to move against the stream that is um, that is encouraging them to lighten up on their children and to move away from the things that were part of their upbringing and to return to those things because our report documents that for a cohort of young black men who 20 years ago we thought to be an endangered species these things help them make it into the middle class. Great, Ron. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Ron Nincy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave us a comment. And be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.